So last year I was asked to give a uh, more thorough update on cervical arthroplasty, and this year hopefully we'll just kind of pick up where we left off last year. And I'm going to start my uh, presentation with this was what the U.S. market looked like about a year ago in terms of uh, disc replacements. There were nine disc replacements that were approved in the U.S. since 2007, and uh, three of them were off market. And just as we did the, this SSF meeting last year, Simplify got the one level indication. So what's changed from last year to this year? Uh, last year we were talking about how Bagheera and Synergy were about to start their clinical trials. So this year, as we move that timeline along, Simplify now has also two level uh, indications that were just given to them uh, in the spring of 2021. And the two ID trials with both Bagheera and Synergy has been initiated and then that's been going quite well as well. Uh, so as we look at all those discs uh, that are currently on the market, uh, this was a, also a slide I shared last year, which was an industry, one of the big players in the, within the arthroplasty space gave this to me last year as far as what their predictions was in terms of growth for arthroplasty versus fusion. You can see that uh, you know they're predicting that uh, fusion will continue to grow and uh, arthroplasty kind of at the lower line uh, at a slower pace. I think this is a more likely uh, scenario. This is my forecast, so and I'm going to tell you a couple reasons why I think uh, more likely over the next few years, especially if we look over the next five years, uh, arthroplasty will see a greater growth and likely fusion, I believe, will uh, flatten out. And there are two main reasons. Uh, uh, one of them is the, what the data that the insurers are collecting. This is something that Jack Ziegler, along with his son, reported a few years ago, looking at the Blue Health Initiative. This was actual insurance data over a period of two years, looking at all their arthroplasties and fusions, and seeing what the total cost was for those two uh, procedures both initially as well as over a period of uh, four years. And you can see that arthroplasty, this is all internal insurance data showing was 12% cheaper. Also within this last year, there was a really good article that Rick Geyer along with Chris Ratcliffe put together looking at the economics of cervical disc replacement. And uh, conclusions were that compared to fusion, CDR was bo both more cost effective and less costly over a seven year timeline. And then the largest driver of cost savings was the reduced rate of secondary surgeries with CDR. So given those two factors, I think that insurers are going to be more and more pushing us towards arthroplasty. The second thing, I think the second driver will be patients. So what I did uh, over this past couple weeks, I contacted our industry partners and uh, I wanted to know what it looks like as far as the different uh, presence that they have online what the, the patient experience looks like and what the growth that they've seen, right? So for example, for Medtronic, they have a pretty good YouTube channel presence as well as within the spine universe. They have a very extensive video library of spinal procedures. And the cervical ADR videos have some of the highest uh, number of views uh, within their YouTube channel. Certainly nothing close to what the Kardashians get, but, uh, but uh, you know, pretty high numbers. And then uh, the video engagement on that site is up 239% year over year. When we go to the M6 disc site, <clears throat> what they reported to me over the past year from September 2020 to September 2021, there's both organic as their overall site traffic has gone up about 350%. The Sentence Rediscover My Life website, which is not a great site, a year over year engagement up 300%. 85% of the searches on the site related to cervical and lumbar ADR. So Zimmers, uh, which is the cervicaldisc.com, this was one of the first sites that focused on CDR. They've always had high traffic volume, but still, over the last year, they've seen 200% uh, traffic growth uh, in this past year. I contacted Nuvasiv about Simplify, and uh, they just recently acquired it, so they don't really have any comparative data related to Simplify. So I think for those two reasons, I believe this forecast looks more likely over the next five years. So then, since I'm a dreamer and fantastic uh, kind of, you know, I do have a great fantasy, what if we looked over the next uh, 10 plus years, right? We went to 2035. Will this ever happen? Will arthroplasty overtake fusion? Well, I think based on what I just shared with you in terms of what the patients are demanding as well as what the insurers are doing, I think this is not an unlikely scenario, but at least at the current time, it seems like fantastic to us. The other thing that's interesting to note is that when it comes to what industry markets to patients, they're marketing arthroplasty and they're marketing motion preservation. When it comes to what uh, industry is marketing to physicians and surgeons, 
it seems like they're still heavily, we go to the meeting, it's still heavily being, they're pushing fusion. You just don't see that many uh, direct to the patient sites that says, uh, you know, get your back fuse.com and that's direct to the fusion, uh, to the patients. Usually those are, uh, as I said, the fusion implants are being marketed heavily to the physicians. So insurance will demand it as well as consumers will demand as well. And I think that's the reason why we may see this happen. So switching gears and looking at reimbursement, this is what the 2021 Medicare rates look like for one level ADR and two level ADR compared to fusions. There's still a fairly good sized economic disincentive to do arthroplasty. When we look at standalone fusions versus ADR, that gap is smaller. When we look at plated fusion versus ADR, uh, ADR still pays about 65% of what uh, a fusion does. On the facility side, it's exact opposite. Just like I reported last year, there's about 40% greater reimbursement on the facility side. So, which reminds me, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Freakonomics, this was uh, you know, Jeff uh, Levitt as well as Dubner. They talked about how morality represents the way that people would like the world to work, whereas economics represents how it actually does work. So that kind of uh, feeds into what I just presented to you in terms of the difference in arthroplasty versus uh, fusion reimbursement. So this is what the 2021 to 2022 proposed Medicare changes look like. We're gonna get point, if my math is correct, 0.27 more RVUs to do arthroplasty. And you would think that would bump up the pay, but then they cut the actual per RVU reimbursement, at least what the proposed is for 2022. So reimbursement for single level will go down about $50. And then when you look on the facility side for ASCs, the reimbursements will go up about six or seven hundred dollars uh, to do this in an outpatient setting. Um, and then another interesting thing that happened this year was that Medicare now requires pre-auth for fusion. So starting July 1, 2021, for all ACDFs, Medicare is going to require pre-authorization versus cervical arthroplasty will not require pre-auth. So I think this may be another little thing that uh, another little piece of headwind that may favor arthroplasty, increased hassle level of trying to get uh, fusion done versus arthroplasty. Maybe that'll push surgeons more towards arthroplasty. Uh, switching gears to look at the ID data, I just want to report kind of the updates that have taken place over the past year. Uh, these are the three main updates. Uh, last year I kind of gave a much more thorough kind of uh, all the different companies, what their ID data looked like. So Zimmer with their 10-year Mobi C data at ISAS reported. Uh, now this wasn't all their sites, right? This was the nine high enrolling centers in the original ID study. Uh, the mean follow-up was about 10.2 years and max was 11.2. Uh, there were 170 patients, uh, which was 74% of those uh, that qualified for the 10-year follow-up x-rays were obtained. You can see the division between one and two level subjects. And uh, again, continues to do incredibly well. You look at that vast neck pain and arm pain scores from seven to 10 years, you still see very, very good relief for these patients. You look at their NDI scores, similarly, it continues to do incredibly well up to 10 years. You look at the segmental range of motion for one level, there was a slight drop from seven, 10 year data, but then the motion, the levels above and below, you look at two levels proximal, two level distal, those patients continue to have very, very good motion up to 10 years out. Uh, looking at the satter alignment, here we have one level and two level, you can see the sagittal alignment that was obtained early on postoperatively and improved for the first couple of years is still maintained up, up to 10 years. And then finally, subsequent surgeries. There was one extra surgery that was performed at the index level between seven and 10 years. So a total of 13 surgeries were revised at the index level and 12, 12 at the adjacent levels at 10 years. So if I bump this graph over to the side, and bring in you know, our, our good friend Hillebrand, who uh, you know, this is obviously an article that many surgeons are familiar with, looking at what things look like on the fusion side with annual incidence of reoperation for adjacent segment disease ranging from 1.5 to 4%. So even on the low end of this estimate, we had 257 ACDF patients, so comparing to the same number of patients that we have on the arthroplasty side. At 10 years, you'll have 39 patients who would need uh, or at least anticipate to need uh, surgery for clinically symptomatic ASD. That's a three-fold difference, so I think that's a fantastic and dramatic difference. So shifting over to M6, this is their four-year data that just reported this year. Same thing with NDI scores follow-up, you can see compared to the fusion, very significant and persistent uh, decrease that they see. Here's their vast neck and arm pain scores, same exact kind of curve patterns that we see with uh, MOBC. 
And then the final one that I'll report on was Simplify. Simplify did a three-year limited data release for, some, uh, for four of their sites. So on the left-hand side, you see their two-year data comparing to Fusion. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the three-year data. And you can see that uh, for, for this case in the mean NDI scores, it's less than right around 10 or so for the 45 patients that were seen for three-year follow-up at those four sites. Same thing when we look at their uh, uh, meek ne uh, mean neck and uh, neck pain uh, uh, intensity scores continue to see decrease in that. And then the last uh, data point here is mean arm pain score. So every one of these updates with the ID, we continue to see very good improvement and uh, you know uh, certainly no worsening even up to 10 years out. And then final piece that I'm gonna try to cover and stay on task and stay on time is the literature. Well, literature, you can spend an hour or two reviewing it. There was a large volume of CDR publications over the past year. I chose articles that are of interest to me and hopefully also uh, to everyone here. And specifically, I, I focused in over the last year, was there any meta analysis data that was published, as well as two topics that are kind of still uh, a bit of a, a mystery to me, and, and we all of us have tried to figure out what is going on with patients who form HO versus patients who have osteolysis. So then I looked at those two uh, topics as well. So just four articles. This was uh, Desai and his colleagues out of Stanford looking at outcomes of cervical disc, disc arthroplasty versus standalone anterior cervical fusion. This was 12 studies that they performed part of a meta-analysis with a total of 859 patients. Their conclusions, on the fusion side, the lordatic angle favored ACF patients by 0.86 degrees, clinically insignificant. But when you look at the other factors, what's the rate of ASD compared to fusion, right? Well, the, uh, the risk ratio is 0.56, so about half. If you have had uh, arthroplasty, your risk of ASD is about half compared to fusion. And same thing with dysphagia, the risk, is, the risk ratio is 0.32. When they looked at the NDI, vast neck, and arm pain score and global cervical angles, they didn't see any difference there among that meta-analysis. So this is another interesting paper out of China. This was 394 consecutive patients at this single center, and they looked at their HO formation after arthroplasty. Two to five year follow up, 67 patients, 67% of the patients had HO, and high grade HO was 11.1%. So, this is the part that I find interesting that the preoperative ossification, so if you have ALL ossification at all, there was significantly associated increased risk, right? So, odds ratio of 3.51 of having HO and then the odds ratio of 2.17 for high-grade HO. Again, single center, but nonetheless, some really useful things for us to think about. When you look at the index range of motion, high-grade HO group had only 3.8 degrees versus 10 degrees for without high-grade HO. Global range of motion similarly was uh, favoring uh, patients who did not have high-grade HO. And then finally, adjacent segment disease. Patients who develop high-grade HO they have significantly higher adjacent segment disease compared to uh, the ones that do not. This was another good article with Ralph Mobs out of Australia. They did a meta-analysis of 53 studies, including 3,200 patients, once again, looking at complications associated with HO. And their results were stratified short-term, mid-term, as well as long-term. Conclusions, ASD was significantly higher at long-term follow-up, which makes sense, than at mid-term follow-up. And then ASD was subsequently and inversely correlated with age. So older the patient, more likely they're gonna develop ASD. Uh, and then also, there was positive correlation of HO at mid-term and long-term follow-up uh, uh, with, uh, with age as well. Dysphagia was inversely correlated with HO. And then the final article I'm gonna to talk to you about, this is on the flip side of things, osteolysis. We all kind of sit and we'll talk about what, why we think osteolysis happens. There's many, many theories that have been put out there. But this one particular study, it was a re review article, it was not a study, it looked at nine studies uh, and they looked at, uh, in, across those nine studies, there were asymptomatic osteolysis incidents of eight to 64%. And most of these were treated with close observation. One of the studies reported that was a 5.3% symptomatic osteolysis requiring further treatment. And this is, again, not to pick on any particular implant because I've seen this with every implant that's out there. What's interesting about this, that at 12 month, you're starting to see some osteolysis around the implant. 16 months, it looks quite threatening with a large cystic uh, bony uh, uh, cyst that's formed right above the implant. So this patient was revised to an ACDF. So some interesting articles for us to, uh, and uh, literature to, uh, to think about and talk about hopefully in our uh, discussion today. And uh, again, with that, I'll, uh, I'll try to stay within my timeline. Thank you so much.
thank you, Armin. Um, we do have time for a question or two before to keep us on time, but go ahead, Jens. So uh, this is, again, an outstanding lecture, and I'm going to say probably about every single lecture today. Uh, uh, my question is pertinent to HO. So I still use the old um, uh, Protoss IDE protocol of bone wax everything completely, two weeks of endomethacin. Uh, what it, I mean, you have done such an amazing job with uh, getting disc arthroplasties in there. Is this reasonable or should we not do that? Are the Chinese colleagues who published that not doing this? So, you know, in their, I look specifically in their material method and see what they do. They did not describe. I mean, that's this is one of the things, you know, when we talk about technique, Unfortunately, a lot of times we report results without really going into the details of the technique. My personal technique is similar to yours. I mean, absolutely fanatical thorough irrigation at the end of the case, making sure all the bone dust is gone, making sure you have thorough hemostasis, and then I will bone wax all the exposed corners of bone, whether it's my Caspar pinhole or if I've taken any bone down, especially anteriorly to get access into this space. Uh, I know some surgeons also, if they take the unsinate down posterior laterally, they'll try to bone wax that too. That to me is, you know, there's a little too much risk trying to push a piece of bone wax back in there with the open canal. So that's one area I don't. But the rest of it, you know, as much as you can, uh, you do so. And I think the interesting thing about Chinese paper was like how there was a correlation with preoperative, right? anterior ossification, there was a higher rates of both uh, HO as well as high-grade HO in those patients. So I think that's something for us to keep in mind as we look at patients and we do arthroplasty. Will that change me from not doing uh, <clears throat> arthroplasty on a patient who has a preoperative ossification? The answer is absolutely not because we know even the patients uh, who go on to form HO, whether it's low grade, high grade, they still clinically do incredibly well. In fact, most of the ID data shows that there's no difference in the patient's outcomes when they follow them and uh, the patients that develop HO versus the ones that don't. Yes? Uh, just awesome talk. Really enjoyed all the data to review that. Uh, one question I had for you for, you know, patients with OPL, um, if you do a disc arthroplasty, if it's still moving, do you attempt to resect the posterior longitudinal ligament with apple palm caret since it's really sort of clean that area out? And if so, do you see a difference in incidence of ossification at the index level versus adjacent levels where that was not done? Yeah, so, you know, uh, where I am in Salt Lake, I just don't see that much OPLL. Perhaps, you know, as we all know, that's much more prevalent in the Asian population. So maybe, uh, you know, in California or here in the Northwest, uh, that, that tends to be a more common problem. Uh, if I were to do a patient with OPLL, which to me, that's, uh, in my mind, is a bit pushing the envelope, because those patients likely will end up with uh, re-ossification. Uh, the answer is absolutely I would take down the PLL. Obviously, the big risk there being getting into the dura because most of those patients will have adherence to the dura. So the risks, you know, nonetheless, if you do surgery for a patient with OPLL, your goal is to decompress them. And if they do have posterior or at least uh, some form of intracanal or foraminal issues related to stenosis, you got to go after it. you got to take care of it and do your decompression anyway, even with a high risk of getting into uh, CSF.